All right, well, for those of you who are here, uh, welcome. And I'm thrilled to uh, host this fifth in the series of six Winter Twilight Grow Around Tables. And this, uh, this evening, we're focused on what not to do to save time uh, in the wash pack or in areas around the wash pack that influence doing less in the wash pack. And uh, this is coming to you from our three year scrub project. Uh, scrub stands uh, for sanitization and cleaning resources for your business. And we got um, we're doing we're doing a lot of things, but this team, some of them are here right now. We got Vern here um, and myself and Andy Chamberlain from UVM and um, also Phil Toko from Michigan State and uh, folks not here from Cornell and also uh, Billy Mitchell from down in the deep south of Georgia. So um, real simple agenda. This for those of you who've been to any of these there you know, this is the same way we do it. We're, we'll do a little bit of an intro, and most of what we're doing today is informal sharing. Um, that's what we're here for, just just chatting about um, things that we've done, experienced. Uh, we're not necessarily the experts in the room. You you all are. I'm, I'm hosting and holding space for this, and we'll do a little eval follow-up at the end. And, um, you know, our scrub project, for those of you who know or don't know, three-year uh, project from the USDA uh, funded and we're developing hybrid resources, a lot of different kinds of resources. A lot of them are posted. Some of them will be posted tonight by Andy in the chat box, I am sure. And we'll also be, we are deploying a lot of resources, meeting with folks one-on-one, -on -one, doing a lot of TA follow-up. And really our, the idea is to try to meet, meet growers one-on-one, -on -one, where they are, identify what they need, and try to su support them. And we're shooting to support several hundred growers. Um, all right, so let's start with this. And I think given the numbers, let's just go around and, you know, where are you from and what's is something in your production system you've learned not to do or this is an either or what's something you wish you could avoid doing or do less of and if you are a service provider uh, you know maybe you have enough experience that you can answer one of these questions as well um okay so i'm gonna actually stop the share and let's just spend a little time doing that all right what we got there how about um, Jason? You want to you want to start? Just introduce yourself, where you're from, and and pick one of those things. Um, I haven't learned very much. So, uh, <laughs> the uh, what of what not to do? I I'm afraid. I um. Uh, I guess uh, if you can avoid it, don't break down your wash and pack station every time you use it. That if that can be avoided, that's how I've done it since I started. So I've been doing that for five years, and this year we're going to try to at least, if not eliminate it, reduce it. So. And what about something you're doing now that you wish you weren't or question the value of it? Anything like that? Breaking mm -hmm. down, let me guess, breaking down washbacks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess, uh, sorry, not much, uh, not much to say. <laughs> that's quite all right okay and if we're in the discussion is great if you do have a video and can turn it on stay muted um, is probably a good idea and pop in when we're talking all right let's move to julie um trying to let's see something i'm doing that i i learned well, not to do is um being a little mindful at the end of the day with your dirty harvest containers that you're putting them somewhere where you're not getting them that much dirtier even when you're in a hurry um let's see yeah i'm having trouble thinking something else for the other part of the question too i wasn't i didn't come prepared today <laughs> that's all right i put putting everyone on the spot it's just as well <laughs> uh andy the next Hi there. Um, Andy Chamberlain from UVM Extension Ag Engineering. Um, on our family farm right now, we're only growing sweet corn, pumpkins, and hay. So thankfully, we don't 
we don't need to do much in the wash pack uh, as far as that goes, but that may change. <laughs> All right, thanks, Andy. And and Burn noted in the chat, which is absolutely spot on to just, you know, say where you're coming from, your farm, where you're located. So I know, Jason, you, you're you in, um, no, I forgot in the town. It's okay. Uh, in yeah. that big state. Our farm, Andrea and my farm is in Saratoga Springs, New oh, York. Yeah. So it's uh, um, a little north of Albany and not too far west of Vermont. Great. And you're ramping up some this year, which is great. And thanks for joining many of these. And Julie, we got some good New York representation tonight. Julie. Yeah. Cambridge Corner Farm in uh, the village of Cambridge, New York, about a mile from the Vermont border near Bennington. And I also work with uh, Hans uh, part time in the CAPS program, supporting uh, growers in that program. And Andy, I think you mentioned where you were from in uh, Jeffersonville. Not Underhill. Underhill. Close. That one. <laughs> um, OK, Carrie or yeah, Carrie, is that how you pronounce it? Kari? Yeah, Curry. That, that, that's right. Um, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm in Shushan, New York, very close to Julie, uh, just a town, little town over. Um, I'm also not prepared, but the thing that comes to mind is uh, that sometimes the wind is worse than the heat when it comes to protecting greens um, if you wash outside, like I do. So, mm just making sure that if you're not going to get to those things that you protect them from the wind and by wetting them down or covering them or mm -hmm. uh, and, and and i would say um be discerning with your spinner depending on the quality of the greens is another kind of there's no one rule sometimes they're just too delicate for the spinner i've found um and don't overfill the spinner of the Fill point has been pretty critical too. That's it. Well, for being not prepared, those are some great ones. And definitely hold on <laughs> to the wind. I was that was one thing I had thought about that I wanted to mention, didn't put in um, uh, put in the intro slides. So it's great. Burn. Hello, everybody. I'm just a backyard. Gardener, but I realized everything I grow is migrated to things that don't have to be washed. <laughs> uh, small fruit right into the freezer, flowers into the vase, and then the compost. Um, and I belong to Elizabeth CSA for many years. And I just stumbled on your amazing Instagram about your trip to Southeast Asia, Elizabeth. And one of your posts you noted, was it Korea, that they don't wash any of the vegetables. So I wonder, I'd like to hear from people about to wash or not to wash. I know on our listserv, there's been a lot of talk about that with carrots and mm -hmm. storage quality, but I'm thinking of customer receptivity too. Thanks, Vern. Yeah, we're definitely going to jump into that. Uh, and tonight, it probably, hopefully will be our most major topic. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, yeah, and so with that, Elizabeth, you want to follow Burn? You yeah, have a video sure, sure. there. Okay, I am here, and I think is the camera. I'm trying to turn the camera. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, cool. So yeah, um, Burn, I did uh, send Han some photos of a uh, daikon in a Korean grocery store that looks um, oh pretty dirty. <laughs> Probably not what you'd consider marketable here. Um, <laughs> And so I guess the thing that I was going to say that I wish I could do was train all my customers to actually wash their own produce rather than assuming that we got it perfectly clean for them. Um, and uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Um, it, but um, uh, yeah, I could also probably name a few things that we don't wash on my farm that a lot of farms do wash. Um, summer squash, zucchini, potatoes, sweet potatoes. Um, and I actually, it's, you know, partly we don't want to, but also just uh, feel like the storage is better. We're less likely to um, scrape them. 
um, just kind of the, the quality holds better in my opinion. Yeah. Great, Elizabeth. And where are you coming from? And oh, yep. Okay. Farm? So, uh, I am at New Leaf CSA Farm in Dummerston, Vermont. And 100 plus members, something like that size. Is that something right? Like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, Lynn. Hello. Um, so I'm recently getting back into farming. I took a little bit of a break. Um, but I'm started managing a farm in Bristol, New York, New Leaf Organic. So um, this is my third day on the job. So I'm trying to um, figure out how to improve and create an efficient wash pack without having seen it in action. Um, but, you know, in, in talking to the farm owner, it seems like consistency in size for wholesale. Um, I know that's not necessarily washing, but um, getting kind of consistency in like standards and all that kind of stuff with a with a new staff. Great. I've always wanted to have new leaf and new leaf in the same room. Here we are. <laughs> you could probably find a few more too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Jason. No, we got Jason. I meant to say not Jason Chandler. Hey, sorry. Um, can you re repeat the prompt for me? Prompt is uh, where you're coming from, farm, and then uh, if, if there is one thing that you maybe used to do and have learned not to do uh, that you can recall, or there's something you do that you know that you wish you didn't do as much, or you know, or could <laughs> do less, or not do. Um, all right, I'm Chandler Briggs from Hayshaker Farm and the Wall Wall Food Hub in Southeast Washington State. Um, we uh, we process a lot of different things here. Um, we have, I, I'd like to um, reiterate the point about wind. It's something that we deal with in certain times of the year and dealing with a lot of fresh, small, you know, salad greens and whatnot. Often that can be a, a worse uh, um uh dehumidifier shall we say than than the sun um but um yeah we there are a few greens that we don't uh, there was also a, a comment about the salad spinner there's a few greens uh specifically claytonia that we don't spin dry because it shows too much damage in the in the the, the speed i suppose and of the um greens uh Forget which brand we have, but it's one of those um, salad floor spinners. Um, um, we have to actually let them air dry in the cooler on crates, so that we do kind of up the price a little bit because of that. It be them being so tender. Um, one thing that we're focusing on right now in our root barrel washer is we we have a pretty silty clay lo loam soil, very sticky, and we do a lot of fall roots. So that makes for some some dirty uh, vegetables in the barrel washer. We were we're working on our food safety plan and getting GAP certified. And the, um, the AstroTurf was given the big X uh, by our food safety experts. So we are um, going to be tearing that out and installing some brush strips that we are purchasing from AZS uh, directly, which is a the, I mean, you all know about the the AZS company, um, and so that's that's one modification that we're making this year for food safety because the astroturf, even though it works very well for cleaning, it it can be a little bit of a food safety question um, in that it can't be properly cleaned and sanitized uh, after every use. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jenna. You didn't call me last year when i was or a few years back when i was on top of my greenhouse putting it together did i can't remember someone who was from washington i think might not have been you it's possible i i I'm, i definitely try and utilize uh all the various services that we have uh across the u.s for for assistance so maybe cool <laughs> that's great uh heidi i think of have, have you haven't gone yet perhaps Is that right hi I'm Heidi Hagman. I'm from Minnesota. I'm a home gardener. I'm just kind of hopping in and listening. Wow. Thank you. How'd you find out about us? 
Just... Oh, I'm in the food safety world. <laughs> You're in the know. Excellent. Well, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. And do you have anything on on your end that you want to uh, you'd you'd love not to do or uh, have learned not to do? Um, uh, no. I All right. Thank you. All right, and I, I'm going to jump in with a, a few photos and stuff we put together. And the reason for doing this, what so what we'd like to do is I want to you know sort of warm people up we've already done that but we actually look at some photos and look at a few things that have come up um that have been obvious or maybe not so obvious that we've run across um and then really work do a workshop so go, go around with like this wind issue with it whatever you know each uh, thing something that's come up for you and maybe it's only a few but really focus on it like what are some solutions get ideas from folks and and um that's the way we'd like to structure this discussion. So this intro that I'll get into, I'll you know also start by saying that definitely not washing greens is the is one thing I've learned to do in my little uh, farm, which is you know it's very, very small, but um, doing um, whatever you know 5, 10, 15 pounds, 20 pounds of greens. Um, for a small local market and learn just learning not to wash some of them and how um, you know and, and how to market it and label label stuff and that's been a cool thing that um, I'm interested in. OK, so let's jump in. So just a couple things, um, you know, I want to start with this main point often misunderstood, which is that, you know, using ag water in or using water period in ag production systems. I don't care if it's irrigation or post harvest, so we need water, but using it is a significant food safety risk. Question is why? So I'll just throw that out and, and wait for wait for an answer before uh, proceeding. This is a fact, so there better be a reason. And I'm, I hope I don't have to wait 30 seconds, which is what teachers are taught to do you know the things that are getting us sick that are generally alive or once were alive so they need water they just need it so. yep well that is true um it, it it definitely the moisture in the air and water in general is what's keeping um pathogens alive uh and it goes beyond that too there's another another element to that water that is the the sort of the key thing why it becomes a risk when we talk about washing or not washing for example um it it spreads whatever you know risk you have on your crop to other crops so like for example a, if a leaf of lettuce has is contaminated and you put it in a big wash tank with tons of other lettuce you run the risk of spreading it or um yeah so it's, it's a great vehicle for spreading whatever you don't want yep. on your crops so bingo yeah thanks lynn um cross contamination vector uh hands and humans can be as well you know surfaces can be but water is by far the biggest uh, cross contamination vector either you know if you're irrigating a crop you know from a from water that's contaminated, you can immediately contaminate all every single 100% of that crop. Um, or uh, same thing can happen in a dunk tank um, if if it's very if it gets contaminated. So what we're going to talk about and everything we're getting into tonight, uh, this is like a caveat. It's just like this this stuff may or may not work for for on your farm. Every farm's different, and so Jeff definitely like test these things out. Don't like take it on faith. Like, oh, this is a good idea, and I have to do it. So just that that's a that's an important thing. And reach out to us and discuss stuff, whatever. Um, you know, not cleaning stuff. A lot of people think, oh, I got to clean stuff, but there's times when it might make sense not to clean stuff. And so we'll get into that um, and definitely test it out and see if you think it works. These kinds of things. So some of them are obvious things not to do and we've talked about a couple of them not cleaning with water or dry cleaning not washing produce at all removing steps um, in har harvesting or field harvesting there's some pictures there of field harvesting um, or tools and pieces of equipment that help you not clean as much uh, so that's that's a big one a lot of people have saved a lot of time um, 
and having things you know clean and organized, not looking for things, not wasting time uh, because you know where things are. These are all really, really essential, important things to to kind of think about, and they're obvious. Hans, one of one of the yeah. examples that comes to mind specifically about not, about not looking for things is having a caddy of of all of the cleaning supplies you need for each station right there. I mean, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, one of the growers in our area have done. Absolutely, like these kits. Uh, Andy's great with that, um, and, and probably that you could post some stuff, Andy, about about some of this, but. You know, you can do kits for on wheels for packing, you know, labeling. Um, I've seen them in greenhouses. Um, I've seen them with, uh, you know, the pack the harvest containers or uh, cleaning supplies, all of that kind of stuff, tools for specific things. OK, so those are those are relatively obvious. There's some also stuff that isn't necessarily as obvious. It might be indirect as well. Um, so there, they might be things you actually do that actually that could help you not do other stuff. So how you know the question is how can some of these things, if you look at them, so field cultivation, harvest strategies, um, you know what? So how could something like mulching uh, reduce time, help you not wash or wash less? Uh, maybe that's obvious. Uh, unexpected habits or routines that um, help you not clean or tidy as much. What could that be? Um, you know, things things in your uh, tasks or scheduling to reduce overall effort. So we might look at some of this stuff. Um, you know, managing customers or orders in a way that reduces uh, wash pack task lists. So that also could be, you know, what we're talking about. Okay, well train your customers to wash produce so that you know if you could do that it would save a lot of time and it would increase the quality of the produce so that might be you know not necessarily obvious one but um, task time management stuff uh, harvest the time you harvest stuff could really actually impact um, the quality of it but also if it was a clean crop that you might be able to get away with not washing it because you don't have to get the field heat out of it um employees so being real clear with employees can help you actually reduce different tasks reduce stress and actually decrease risks overall as well do and folks a, have I'm yeah, just going to go jump in do folks have anyone have animals too that they that they manage or livestock whether it be chickens or other critters like that yes okay. we have draft okay. animals OK, so one of the things that we talk about with folks that have animals and raise considerable food uh, produce is looking at some of the livestock. So, the, you know, if, if you order essentially order your days, so you do a lot of the produce washing and packing first before you go, you know, working with livestock and such, if possible, because then you're not tracking, you know, animal poo into into a wash pack. And it it's a little bit it's a it's a lot less of a hassle to have to walk, get get a new pair of boots and possibly change your clothing before you go do that as a way to schedule or time manage so with sort of food safety in mind. So yeah, thanks. Those kinds of questions are scheduling stuff. This photo here is is interesting. This is from Footprint Farm, you know, up in Starksboro, Vermont, and Taylor did this. She. You know, it took time for her to do this. This is, the, you know, just very clear there. What is their more their task? These are the cleaning tests, the things that they do each day. And you might think, well, that's more. It takes more time to make that. And it's all the stuff and you're still cleaning. You got pigs in there. You got a lot of different things. However, um, you know, you imagine um, how this kind of thing over time oops, can really change the situation for because you don't have to ask about employees. The employees put the little dot in there when they're done with it. And, you know, the just the, the time that is saved. Um, so you're not wasting time communicating, trying to figure out if people have done certain things, being stressed about it. Uh, the ease of the day can change a lot and that can also uh, decrease through safety risks too in this this whole thing. Um, all right, cleaning now. So we're not talking about washing produce or dunking produce. This is like 
the actual cleaning of surfaces. And you might say, oh, okay, well that we definitely need to clean. Well, sometimes actually not cleaning might help decrease food safety risk. And why might that be? Um, any any ideas on that? Um, oftentimes there's lots of dirty rags that don't get actually properly cleaned on farms and just reuse again, vehicles for grossness because no one wants to do laundry on farms. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. I hadn't thought of that, but absolutely. <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of battles of doing rag laundry on different farms. So. Mm -hmm. That last bullet there is a little um, a little bit of a hint of a one of a major, um, potentially a major thing, you know, when going in and cleaning, uh, you know, you're not really removing the back you know bacteria well Leah, look at that and, and see if, see what you think you know dry floors no spray how how could that help a situation you know there's just the food safety stuff going on think about back you know the pathogens that are on surfaces or potentially on the floor or that kind of thing so uh katie dykstra is here and and she was one of the people that that we had invited to talk a little bit about kind of how she manages or how she's managed dry cleaning in okay. some other operations. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a good time to yeah. kind of hear from Katie how that, how how you manage. So Katie, do you want to give a little background about who you are, what you do, and and then how you've used dry cleaning to kind of save time? Let me Hi, just get out and... Katie, welcome, and let me just jump out of this slide and turn it over to you because I think it's a really perfect um, uh, intro to what you're about to talk about. So the yeah the cleaning oh, dry so dry cleaning dry floors no spraying um, you're not spr basically spraying potential pathogens all over the place uh, that they're landing on contact surfaces etc. Um, so that kind of Dry cleaning can be very helpful sometimes. Bacteria can't survive in dry environments, so it can be a much lower risk and also take less time. And yeah, Katie, I'm, let's turn it over to you, and I'm going to back out of this these slides and just we can chat for a minute if you want to informally share that. And Hi, welcome. can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay. Hi, sorry, I'm a little late. I thought it started at 4.30. Um, I uh, work... Um, in the food safety industry in Michigan and some of the growers I work with do dry cleaning in the on onion packing sheds. And um, mainly it's due to a lot of the equipment can't get wet mm -hmm. because it'll get ruined. So at the end of the day, the cleaning is mostly done with um, air and sweeping. We move a lot of the, the debris with air hoses and and in between the rollers and all the equipment and then um the only water that's used is on like the rollers and that's cleaned with like a alcohol type cleaner or like a bleach but it's mainly just dry cleaning every day to pick up all the loose debris and Katie, does that um sorry, how do you does that maintain a sanitary like work environment? Or I mean I assume it does. Well, I mean, yeah, I feel like it gets kept up on and the cleaning's done daily. Um the latest thing that we've had to add to the program is we still do have to do environmental swabbing um on some of the food contact surfaces so that would kind of play into if we are you know carrying pathogens and stuff um and that was recently just due to the latest um onion recalls in the last couple of years that has been made mandatory by some of the customers but for the most part it feels like it's clean and sanitary I mean, because we keep up on it and sometimes during the year we'll take like a break and certain pieces of equipment will get a deeper cleaning, even though it's not necessarily all with water. Okay. Or like a sanitizer, I guess. 
So that did the swabbing, uh, do you have results back from that? Like any anything about what some of these pec, like listeria, I bet would be lower because of, there's no water around. It really doesn't do well or something, but yeah. What did yeah, you that's typically, we haven't had anything come back positive, um, but we're just doing listeria and then um, like total aerobic plate count testing or like coliform mm -hmm. testing. To be clear, um, just yeah. to be clear that this is the, the folks she's dealing with are larger growers. The reason we brought her in is because we can use some of the same concepts on smaller farms. I would never recommend environmental yeah, monitoring don't do it. <laughs> unless unless your buyer absolutely requires it. And there's lots of buyers who don't require it. So. Yeah, don't do it unless you have to do it, please. Um, but yeah, the dry cleaning seems to be sufficient. I mean, because there's a lot of dust in the onions. Um, another thing that is used in in place of water would be like a vacuum. They kind of use we kind of use like a vacuum to vacuum up larger particles of the debris from the onion. But I mean, it's mainly just air and sweeping. Yeah, that's great, and and is a helpful window you know a lot of uh, the growers on this call are very diversified and they're running a lot of stuff through their production systems and they've got to get dirt off and they've got to remove field heat so it may be that water has to be used but mm -hmm. it's still you know i think that in in these within these systems there are places and times where you might everyone might be able to get away with um, either not washing products getting those through first uh, doing uh, dry a uh, first step dry cleaning of um, either bins, harvest bins, food contact surfaces, etc. Leaving those, um, not having the floor wet if if it, if you can avoid it, and and maybe doing spot cleaning. There's there is, uh, there are various things that could actually if we can, if we can keep things dry, it will save time and also probably lower counts of uh, bacteria that do really well in water, like listeria and and also E. coli to a certain extent and um, some of the some of the others. So and that's, I think, the biggest point. Uh, if the other home. thing that I I think I'd like to add to that is just that, you know, when when you're thinking about uh, if you've got a zone area where you're keeping certain certain uh, goods, like if you do sweet potatoes or or winter squash along with onions mm -hmm. and garlic, all of those things usually like the same environment and they like it really dry. So those are particularly good areas to clean with like a dry cleaning style, this kind of taking a vacuum cleaner to it essentially to, to vacuum up the dirt and sweep in it and such. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you all know, uh, I don't even have to say it, but like if, uh, if you know, pieces of leaf uh, spinach or lettuce end up drying and sticking on a bin, uh, it becomes, you know, multiple times harder to wash. And mm -hmm. so the timing um, and even batching of these quick sort of either brush off or dust off, uh, dry getting the obvious stuff that can stick on even, you know, and make sure there's nothing visible, uh, that can be really important and it can save a lot of time uh, just to get get into that. And that that's what this spot dry cleaning and spot cleaning can be. Um, and then deep cleaning is really important and you can schedule it. Um, you know, I think biofilms can develop, especially if things are wet a lot and you don't even see them. But if you're if you're able to scrub a surface with detergent uh, once a week say just even if it doesn't it looks semi-clean if it's been wet and used a lot I think that's probably an important an important step but not needing to do that all the time all right let's look at a few more things here and then um and okay so uh SOPs that's you know another one um you know, they can, it definitely can reduce the. I mean, the question is why? Why can an SOP really reduce overall cleaning time? Uh, if you think you might think, oh, well, that means I have to clean things more. But um, you know, what 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 comes up there? Uh, 
Um, is that, Katie, I'm not sure if that's your, um, maybe you want to mute unless you're about to say something. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's totally fine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we don't need to spend time on this, but basically, again, if you can do these quicker, you know, a, a, a quicker removal, right, dry cleaning, sweep, dust, rinse, uh, that will really help save time over time. And then batching scheduling and having very clear SOP over time. I'm not sure it, it, who's here, but basically if you're if you're batching this, these deeper cleanings are spending more time. If you look at your total hours, it's going to go down. And I've certainly, there's plenty of growers um, that I've talked to and have reported that that's a, a good way to go, whether it's a, you know, Thursday afternoon for there's two, two people that are on this job or whatever. Um, and I'm not going to spend time on this, but picture SOPs, getting everyone on the same page. This is the kind of stuff that isn't necessarily obvious, but it can really, really save time. This is, you know, a, a just not a very fancy wash pack, an evening song farm, but they do a good job just like having having that picture up and they kind of get it all set each each day like that. And um, that is a very helpful thing to think about. Just putting pictures up and, you know, keep the text low. Um, and then it's 10 minutes at the end of the day just to, Turn, turn things around. Um, so for washing, not washing produce, this is what I was just talking about earlier. Like this, let's let's get into this. So some examples of when and why you might want to do that. And in this case, um, I was working mostly with different crops coming in and bigger carpet crops of spinach that were on a second harvest or third harvest, but they were carpet absolutely clean and they're too big to go through the spinner basically they could do it but they would get damaged the quality was so much better and this is like the story that what, what i ran into it was so clear that the quality was way better the temperature was low i didn't have to get the field heat out um, and i could actually because the spit the leaves were bigger they were still very good and tender uh, they could be eaten raw they could be braised I could pack bigger bags and it literally went so, it goes so quick and the quality was so good uh, to not wash them. So that was, you know, one thing, this is, you know, what I came up with and, you know, getting this early morning and we can get back to that, but timing. Um, and then this is a bad example, this photo, because there's some moisture in it, the way it happened. Normally it was a lot drier, but you can see there, it just says we did play with the label and um, the other, I don't have the other labels, but basically it would say triple, the other label said triple rinsed, ready to eat. And this one, if you see the small print, just says, um, please rinse or rinse before use. We tried a couple of different things. All of them were fine. And the quality, these things lasted like so much longer than the washed, the washed uh, spinach. So if you've seen that, and it was fine with the customers. They didn't have any issues that we heard of and everyone loved it. And they loved that it was a higher quantity too. We could definitely like pack a eight ounce bag instead of a five ounce bag or something like that. And I'm gonna have, uh, in this case, other things that could, you could think about not washing. And Elizabeth, yeah, why don't you let us talk to us a little bit about this photo and what you what you learned? OK, yeah. Um, all right. So on one side is the um, normal normal for Korea grocery store daikon. Um, mm -hmm. And the other one is some daikon that I harvested on a farm in Korea. And I was just kind of following the farmer's instructions and they said, okay, just give it a quick wipe down with a rag and we're gonna um, wrap it in newspaper and put it in the mail. Um, Cause that's how they deliver their veggies there. <laughs> and so that, that was um, really interesting. Um, one thing it makes me think about because a lot of these, um, a lot of the produce in Korea is gonna be fermented. Um, not all of it. They also don't wash lettuce and nobody ferments the lettuce. But um, so, um, things like daikon though, they might. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, 
Hmm. I mean, so much of food safety is like, how are we getting, how can we get rid of microbes and keep the, keep from spreading microbes and get, get everything clean? And um, what about promoting healthy microbe communities? Um, and I, I don't, I don't know if anybody's studied this or, or knows the science behind it, but it seems like part of the purpose of, of um, not washing the produce in Korea, it has, has to do with um, having a, a living kimchi that's gonna you know, come out of this. And um, how do we maintain a healthy micro community on the daikon, um, which it's not gonna reach the consumer sterile in any case. So um, yeah, that, that was what was really interesting to me about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and certainly like having your kids eat dirt, very helpful <laughs> for immune system development and and gut health and all sorts of things. Um, so yeah, that's a good, it's a definitely a good question. Would it any any thoughts on that or comments? Yeah, well, I've I've thought about definitely thought about it. And uh, Elizabeth, are you thinking, you know, in terms of your customers um, and educating them? the have you tried uh, or what have you tried or not in that um, um, okay. with CSA customers? Um, yeah, OK, so. Um, so hmm. so sometimes I mean, especially with salad greens, um, we're fairly often able to get them really clean and other times we find that oh gosh it rained hard we can't really um, get everything clean and just you know try to put up some signage but not everybody gets it um and it, or like taking spinach or something home and expecting that they're not gonna have to wash it um not everybody wants to read um is the problem <laughs> so you get people who don't who who try to eat it without washing it on their own um and um, yeah, I do it like norm new member orientations, tell people like we really recommend that you wash things, um, you know, tell them a story about somebody who brought home a bunch of Swiss chard from pick your own and fed his family some bugs because he didn't wash it, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I try those things, but um, I, I don't know, I think, consumer expectations are are really an interesting thing um mm. and uh I, you know i think you know, we kind of spoil people <laughs> in this country sometimes um the japanese consumers are even more spoiled though yeah totally <laughs> hey taylor nice welcome you're you're not cooking Oh, you're also muted. <laughs> you're you are muted. Who knows? Um, OK, well. Sorry, I was just going to ask uh, welcome some new any new participants too, and just get in this conversation. I'm you know, there's a lot here. I'm, I'd love to hear more about this, you know, other products people have not washed uh, potentially, or if if there's any questions about pr crops, they may or may not be able to wash. Uh, just have a little more discussion about that. because I think it's a really important topic uh, and the quality can be a lot better. Uh, potentially in certain situations if if crops are not washed and risk can be lower. So yeah, anytime you can not wash a crop and get away with it from a produce safety perspective, you should not wash that crop because it, it really is going to be a better situation overall um, than, than introducing this cross-contamination factor uh, into the crop and also between crops. So well, yeah, what some sharing here about any any other crops or things people are thinking about? Um, I have something about winter squash. Um, mm -hmm. So I started planting winter squash along landscape fabric to keep it really clean, so I didn't have to wash it at all or or touch it. Um, but we started doing um, the stuff that we wanted to hold on to for a long time is dunking it in sanitate to pre prevent any 
additional rot in storage, um, whether like how useful it is and the efficacy of that, I don't know because we just started doing it. Um, but yeah, just curious about, you know, for storing winter squash, like I know the less you handle it, the better to prevent nicking and stuff. But if, if anyone has any pointers on ways to reduce rot in, in storage or, or how people wash winter squash, whether they do or not. Well, you're definitely getting a die off of surface, some die off of some surface bacteria. Some of them may be um, bacteria that would rot, prevent or promote rotting. There's a lot of other factors at play, is my understanding. Not only the nicking, but the amount of moisture, how far spaced things are, the different the temperature extremes and the fluctuation in humidity. Um, all of those things will impact the spoilage rates. So that's one variable, right? And and if you can control all the other variables, you might be able to actually learn something from it. <laughs> but it may it may take a little time and and some good control. Other thoughts from other people on the um, on the winter squash topic. Um, I think if you can avoid harvesting. With when the dew is gone, if you're able to wait for the dew to be gone, that can make a huge difference in the cleanliness of it coming out of the field. Same with same with summer squash and even zucchini, cucumbers. If you're doing field cucumbers, um, if you can wait for the dew to dry off, there's much less field dirt coming in. Even before curing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think I ever thought about that. I just always harvest greens first and those in the afternoon, but that's a that's a good thing to keep in, in mind is that do for some of those crops and, we're, and not washing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, can you hear me now? Um, yeah, I'll take it. Um, we on that same train don't wash um, cucumbers or zucchini and harvest them later in the day and just do a dry cloth wipe to get like the little prickles off. Mm -hmm. um, but that's been awesome and great for quality long-term storage. Longer. So you've seen a qualitatively, you've seen a significant change in the sort of how the storage and also the quality in general. Yeah, it feels like the, the only time we are riskier with quality now with them is if there's if there's field heat in them. So it's a tricky balance between harvesting, harvesting them late enough that there's no, no dew on them, but early enough that they can cool down before they go in the walk-in. Because if they go in too quick, then that's your back. Right. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Taylor, how do you, um, this is Chandler from Washington State. How do you um, store your cucumbers then? Because we can harvest them dry, but if we pack them in any sort of plastic around them, they the moisture builds up. But if we do them straight, we find that they get floppy within a day. We do one of two things primarily. We put them into flip-top totes, so not a plastic liner, but just into the totes. And... They do fine as long as they're not warm going in. We'll also do a wax box loose with, we'll take a plastic bag that's about the same size as the top if it's not open. So it's like a flat plastic bag and we'll just lay that on top. So it'll keep a little bit of humidity in so they don't flop. Um, and that works pretty well if we're going to be sending it out. We have a few customers who want wax boxes and that's the only way we've found to manage the humidity um, on, we've got a cool bot walk in. So I know that's a factor. It's pretty dry in there. Are you doing, are these CSA customers or some of this wholesale, Taylor? To... Some of it's wholesale. Yeah, some of it's wholesale, but for the most part, it's CSA. Mm -hmm. Which, so yeah. I had a question about that. So then when you're writing on your wholesale bags, unwashed, is that something we should be doing for a cucumber that goes out to a retail establishment? To me, it seems like it's 
if it's grown in a high tunnel and it's on a pine, it's not touching the ground, it feels like it's cleaner than if we walked it. Yep. I would agree. And zucchini are going to cook for right. the most part, but yeah. we don't wholesale and that. As well. Any other comments? Of what I would I come down to, what it comes down to for me is that I kind of think, OK, not washing is going to be better in general, but customers have a different idea. They think if a crop is unwashed, it is somehow not going to be you know, unsafe or something, uh, which is uh, a misunderstanding. Um, so even saying unwashed on the label is maybe a bad idea. This is like rinse before use or, you know, just something like that, just managing that. And then also putting these more positive spun emails out to your, your you know, your CSA group or something, or or it's a wholesale customer, you know, same same thing. It, it, if it's a clean, totally clean product, you don't need to say anything. But if it's something where there might be a tiny bit of grit that shows up or something, you know, just having a statement like rinse before use or or whatnot, it's probably a good idea. OK, thank you. I happen to have a, a, a website writer that was consulting with me. He was my partner on all these labels and stuff. So we really got into this, um, into the messaging. And uh, it was it was quite a lesson for me. <laughs> um, OK, any any other things on that? And we, we have some more photos here as well. Um, I'm I would love again if, if people have things on their mind to just bring them up. I mean, either uh, just unmute and pipe up or ask a question anytime um, and we'll jump into it, workshop it. That's kind of what we're doing. So um, I'm happy to. I have a to yeah. yeah, shoot. <laughs> I, my question is about drying tote. So mm -hmm. like it's so humid in the wind in the summer that we I, we never really pack into a dry tote. You know, we rinse them. We don't have so many that we can clean them and let them fully dry. You know, we're rinsing them, scrubbing them in the morning and we're packing into them a few hours later. What's the recommendation as for, for that? Yeah, that's right. Best practice, obviously dry totes um, or allow them to dry, but I can see that that doesn't happen in many situations. So, you know, especially if they're getting multi-use, these are like harvest, harvest totes, they're going back out to the field or, there no we we try to wash harvest totes at the end of the day so that they can dry because they seem like they would be the bigger risk um mm -hmm. but more the the flip top totes and they've got like the flip top stripping on e the everybody and mm -hmm. um yeah and they're they're they have they're holding like a raw eaten crop um that is going into the cooler and then it's going either into wholesale uh, to wholesale account or it's getting divided up into CSA retail bags or something. Yep. Are you are you sanitizing these Taylor as well or just just washing? On a day to day basis, we're we're usually just rinsing unless okay. there is visible like scum or plant to breathe and we'll use soap and then we try to do a sanitize twice a year okay. um like twice during the growing season but this is the biggest question that comes up to me when I do our food safety training with crew is is how could we ever get a dry coat and is it necessary mm -hmm. yeah it's a good question obviously and you have the same so I mean the good news is you're not talking about a ton of water right it's it's not like it's in a dunk tank so that there's not a wholesale cross-contamination issue necessarily so that's a risk reduction in and of itself but yeah it should be especially the pack out containers think of it like you're for your your family or whatever you're putting something in the refrigerator with that you're eating later you know some salad or whatnot and yeah do you want that container clean ideally dry and if there's water in it um uh, yeah the water should be 
you know, you should have reasonable assurance that you've either washed it either with soap or it was never that clean since the last, I mean, it was cleaned well before and it's just been rinsed out. It, you're, you actually know where it's been. So you have some record record of that, um, you know, in your, in your head, right? It's not like it's been out, it's sitting at a drip line behind Hannaford or something like that for two weeks and then you're getting it back and throwing greens in it. Taylor, um, how much airflow do you have where they're drying? That's another thing. Um, I mean, they're they're outside, so there is significant airflow, but we stack them in a pyramid. And so the ones on the bottom, they're always, they've got dripped down and then in a little handle, there's water. So when you flip it back over, water comes yeah. back on everything. And I feel like the handle is often the dirtiest part um right. but I wonder one thing that's coming to mind as you were describing that Hans is maybe if there's a particularly gross tote or if it's coming back from somewhere where we're like ooh their storage is weird maybe we can separate those and make sure those ones dry or those ones don't go right back into rotation mm -hmm. yep and that's one of the important points I think is just this you know figuring out a holding place or being able to batch some of the the more the deeper cleaning or drying that would need to happen so that you have a pallet you know that's set aside where you could throw some things that just you know you want you want to get better cleaning or drying to um it's a good question taylor i don't know if anyone else on the call has some answers um and i definitely want to kind of put our heads together as a team too and think about this because i i think this is not just you i've definitely noticed this and heard people talking about it um, but yeah, it may be, you know, another possible option I'm just thinking is um, you, you know, there may be some spot cleaning or of certain things that are gross that are aside um, and and or some, you know, sanitizer in the handles upside down or whatever, if they're sitting there, you know, just I don't know, it may, it may be it couldn't hurt probably. So that's just one one thought I have. And yeah, another one might be, well, it, yeah, you have a limit of totes and limit of drying ability. So you have some limits. Any other thoughts from folks on the call? Ways to decrease risk in that situation? Is it, Taylor, uh, are, you, are you sanitizing? Oh, sorry, go ahead. It's Vern, I was just asking, is it a sunny place or they're outside? I mean, obviously that would help wind and sun to get them drier sooner. Is relocation a possibility to make it more helpful? And are they upside down to drain if, at any time or are they always right side up? Yeah, that's a that's a good point. They're under cover. They're outside, but they're under cover because it rains so often that we wanted somewhere undercover to dry them off. Um, but I wonder if we are talking about, especially the gross ones, could we set that pallet up outside or have a stack of gross ones that get washed on a sunny day or something like that? Um, and then, yeah, they're, they're upside down in a, a pyramid shape to quote unquote dry, but like I was saying that it just, the top ones drip down onto the bottom ones and it catches in all the crevices. Mm -hmm. We have collected a bunch of Andy's special brushes to get the crevices, but those flip top totes are just. Times. And it's kind of a crazy idea, but I have seen on a couple of farms for washing totes, these kind of spinner systems. I know Seth Jacobs over in Argyle made a really cool one where it's like a, inside out barrel washer you clamp them on there's sort of metal metal rods that hold them you slide them in they're held and that way you, you can spin them and put a hose or a power wash on them and even the spinning just you know gravitationally forces water off just so they're going to dry a little faster but that's one more thing to make and do and this this webinar is about not doing stuff and how many bins are we talking, Taylor? Like, and could you get more pallets and not put them in a pyramid and have them out in the sun if it's if you have sun kind of thing? You know, 
using using your resources? Yeah, it's possible. If we expanded much, we'd be off of concrete and then mm -hmm. in in the wind blowing. And then we're pretty close to where my dog poops. If we get too mm -hmm. much farther away from the house. Um, but yeah, I like I like the idea of quarantining groceries because I think that's pretty straightforward and understandable for people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good uh, important step of uh, strategy for a lot of things. I think repairs and um, other things, tasks that need doing that you can't, it'll interrupt your flow to do them in the moment. Um, one thing that, that we've done, which we use, uh, we've used like landscape fabric for a, like a pad for, for drying stuff. Um, but then also like kind of like number two crusher run. Um, but like, I always had like a designated wash pack person. And so then as they, they grab bins, sometimes they'll just like flip, flip the pyramid into the sun. Um, like as they're taking bins away. So that's just something that we kind of got in the habit of because we tried to have a policy of you can't put bins away until they're dry. Um, and those handles are always, they just suck. Um, so we, we were less strict about that with um, like field harvest bins, but stuff that we were packing in the cooler, um, you know, we tried to, you know, as we were taking down the pyramid, just take it off and then put it in the sun on landscape fabric for a little bit um, and just kind of create a system where, you know, we find the dry ones and then we just flip the, the not quite dry ones into the sun on landscape fabric. That, mm -hmm. that kind of worked for us just because we did have a dedicated wash pack person who, you know, lived and breathed uh, bins. So that was something that they were really on top of. So for me, like having a point person for that kind of stuff really helps. Um, Cause when the whole crew is kind of trying to find a clean bin or like a dry one, um, that's when it gets a little not as successful. So it's simple, but that that's what worked for me in the past. All right, other questions, things? I can keep going. You got like a, a laundry list. Well, yeah. they're good. I mean, this is what we're here for is workshopping this stuff, throwing out hard questions. Here's some things you'd, I'd like to do less, but or whatever. Yeah, so shoot. OK, root washing bunches of roots that still have tops on them by hand or with a hose nozzle. Um, I'm always there's there's dirt that's really hard to get out of, say, the tops of carrots. Mm -hmm. especially the way that we've been washing they like drip on each other um so we're we're trying to troubleshoot that a little bit this year and the two ideas that we're having one i think we're definitely going to do is is cutting the greens in the field on carrots specifically so there's not as much of them um to be dripping on each other but the other one and that i'm curious about is has anyone done the foot pedaled root washer thing it's like a youtube sensation yep uh, andy do you have access to that i don't know if you're there and can post, post i think that. Andy's got a link somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah he might probably. be able to pull it up but i just yeah so what's the, what is the I problem haven't... just that is the problem that you've got your your holding and you're kind of spraying dirt around and sort of holding on to stuff and spraying at the same yeah, time. Yeah, depending on how careful the person is who's spraying, you're just spraying dirt onto. Okay, this is like a wildly externality person spraying dirt back onto the other ones, but more it's spraying them off and then laying clean ones on top of each other. But the greens are still dirty. I don't know how you clean the greens. Mm -hmm. Um. So removing the carrot tops, that'll help. But the other one, like a beet, is a similar idea. Mm -hmm. We've tried and your soil like is how is it pretty sticky? What's your soil like? And and what do you how how hard do you need to hit it? No, it's not super sticky. It well, it depends. It depends on how recently it's rained. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, yes, pretty sticky. And you're doing it outside the spray. Outside. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the, well, the foot pedal. If you use the foot pedaled one, I'm, I'm curious about some 
construction y points on that. Andy, have you ever, did you go and see that at all, or have you just seen it online? Yeah. No, I just followed the YouTube sensation myself. <laughs> haven't haven't seen it or tried it yet, but I, yeah, it's not simp not hard to construct, but you'd need something to screw a nozzle to, <laughs> so you kind of set up a station. A simpler. Okay, do this again and tell you how it goes. Yeah, there's a simpler thing too, um, which I have a photo of. I'm just trying to pull up. Uh, that is a um, you use a, a one of those lamp arms, you know, the retractable lamp arms, and just mount a, a sprayer on it. And so it at least you know it's more or less running. It's not necessarily attached to a foot pedal. It could be pretty easily. You can buy like you know thirty dollar foot pedals, stainless steel on Amazon, just run the hose into that and and have it come up. So imagine a nozzle on like a lamp arm and you just set it right there and you're, you've got an, a, an operating station basically. And so you're able to use two hands and sort of manipulate the stuff and it can go a lot faster. You lose use less water. I do actually somewhere have a photo of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I'll refine my my particular issue with the bunched roots mm -hmm. is that then you put them all into, you know, a bulk bag or a flip top tote or something. And the dirt that is still in the greens then drips onto the clean roots or puddles at the bottom is my particular issue. I'm trying um, to think of how I do what, uh, our our thing. We don't really have that issue, so I'm curious. There's something I'm doing, not knowing what I'm doing, that's saving me that hassle. So, you know, I'll just tell you what I do, and then you decide if it's relevant. Um, we just harvest all the carrots when we're not uh, when we're bunching them, and then we throw them in a dunk tank. Then, you know, that doesn't really clean the roots, but it just does get probably does clean the greens somewhat or you know the things fall into the bottom of the tub instead of on the neighboring carrot bunch underneath it when we put it in a harvest crate so that may be what we do different um but uh then we just spray them and then if you have uh like problems maybe with the the greens not being able to take such a hard spray you know just use a nozzle that you can adjust i, I don't know that's and jason are you are they in your dunk tank bunched or are they loose and then you bunch them after? Yeah, we just we just uh, throw them in like a, a large one of those large orange bushel baskets and then um, bring them to the dunk tank and then just drop them in. And then uh, like, and then we'll bunch them up as after we've uh, actually um, probably after we've sprayed them. So after we've cleaned the roots, so we don't have a washer, we just use a table. And uh, yeah, so I'm, my my uh, my I think I've done it both ways, and so I'm not like really serious about it. But I think we don't we don't even bunch them until they're ready to go in the crate. Okay, right, cool. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say, I think part of how they're packed in the crate obviously impacts how much dirt's on the greens. But I I have I keep a sink. I just dunk the tops after I've sprayed them if they have excessive soil. I do that with beets and carrots. I just give them a quick dunk and a shake and it goes in the pile. Oh, that's a great idea. Just a little sidecar to dunk the top. But, yeah, and sometimes it'll even be a bucket. Like if it's like, I mean, I, I, I don't do a huge production, but you know, with radishes, sometimes it'll just be a five gallon bucket. So I can just give it a quick rinse on the greens. Yeah, we're not too worried about the water being on the greens either. So we do sometimes dunk them before you know we put them in the crate and then and then take them right to the cooler wet i guess what about field packing have you ever tried to do that with a dunk uh, a dunk tank of some kind with carrot you know because when it's easier to get the stuff off right right when you pull <laughs> if you if you pull and bunch in the field take the tops off and you have a dunk a bigger dunk tank there on a tractor cart or something and you can just pack them directly as you're as you're picking the bunches or have someone who's doing that out in the field. 
might be a, an option if the spray is not needed. Many things to think about. OK. Um, great. Taylor, you got more other people? <laughs> How many people use mulch or no till or some situation to avoid washing melons or pukes or any of that stuff? You haven't I, done that. Yeah. I use them on on melons and uh, winter squash for sure. Yeah. Well, that definitely has is a very helpful thing if you if you don't do it and doing it in um, multiple different kinds of crops and you know wherever there could be splash um, and you know it helps with a lot of other things as well so erosion and soil fertility and moisture all of that what about garlic how about um, anyone have some garlic tips you know that what to wash or not to wash um, I've done some, I've wiped garlic and then trimmed it after it's cured and it's worked quite well. Um, seems a lot faster. Any tips or thoughts on garlic? Um, I usually just wipe each bulb quickly with a rag, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. And, and picking the harvest time has been helpful too. If, if you, is anyone else? You know, the exact, you know, getting a drier, a slightly drier harvest or mm. if you're going to wash it, a wetter harvest, probably. I, I have found that dry, drier is better, um, though I will say, I, I don't know if you all saw the, saw the email about to spray or not to spray the garlic. And um, I did not spray it this year, but um, I talked with Elizabeth Keene, who has been doing this forever. Um, and she did this past season and she said she'll never go back, that it it just was night and day. Um, mm. And they they field sprayed it. They 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 were able to harvest it, I think, onto a trailer and just sprayed it in the field. Mm. That's great. We've sort of gone the opposite of that with garlic and we'll harvest it, carry it in the green, I would trim the tops in the field cure it in a greenhouse and then we throw it into like onion bags big mesh bags and then we trim the top down a little bit more maybe um and just kind of by that time there's not much dirt in it and we've been selling it with the roots on mm. um so there's a just to to see what the uh, csa members could handle and that's been a nice like reduction of so we only touch garlic or we only you know process it once which is that cut in the field mm -hmm. or top cut and you're pointing to the see if you know see if the customers can handle it and it definitely keep coming back to you know the messaging because there's something about the fun, like whatever like use language around you know or try you know, maybe you've done that you know like garlic in the raw or, you know, whatever. This is like the natural, you know, have fun with the natural blah, blah, blah you know, whatever. Um, there's, it's it's amazing. I think what people are psyched to jump into if they, if there's sort of like a fun, good, you know, exploratory um, messaging around it. Um, uh, okay. yeah, I've done ahead. is also like after harvesting and cutting the tops off laid out in the field to be like right before lunch, do it, break for lunch, let it kind of hang out in the sun and then come back. Just with clay soils, you just bring in so much mm -hmm. soil. It's, it's ridiculous. So I got kind of sick of having to clean so much um, after harvest. So really just kind of letting it hang out in the sun after harvest um, for a little bit if I can with, with weather. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I'm just seeing here if there's any anything else that might spur some conversations. So, yeah, I mean, re resources, thinking about resources, I think is helpful how to not waste them. And they it's not just the obvious time, money, uh, energy, but think about brain power, social capital, that kind of stuff. And when you start expanding out there, if you're and this is where like SOPs come in, if you're kind of stressed um, thinking about did someone get you know, did I communicate this well enough or the, all these things are running through your head, all the worries and 
whatnot, it, it does actually use up your precious energy uh, and brain, <laughs> the brain really is using energy all the time. So thinking about, you know, this, I think, you know, Taylor mentioned this last time, the, the clarity of, you know, having these clear SOPs and actually working on them up front really can save not only time resources um, with communication, but also your maybe flow and the the cleanness of your mind basically throughout the day when things are are um, a little bit more uh, scripted um, or clear in your crew. People are on the same page. So that could go a lot of different places and we don't have time to get into it. But um, yeah, just a lot of different other little things um, for about resources. Uh, Pre-split garlic was was an, uh, an idea that had I think Phil had come up with. I don't know. If, actually, it yeah. was a it was actually a grower that, that did this. We were talking uh -huh. originally about the fact that she had she was like, my my garlic doesn't last through the winter, and I was like, "Well, what what do you plant?" She says, "I plant music," and I buy, and and I was like, "Well, I you know, maybe you could plant a later season gar a later harvest garlic, and that would do better." And she's like, "Well, when we're planting garlic in October, we've got lots of other things going on, so I buy it from Pete's Greens, pre-split, ready to roll." Not to, I don't want to plug a particular company. I don't want to endorse them necessarily, but she buys them from there, and and they only sell one variety like that, and and so that's the variety she plants. And so, um, I was like, that's a great idea. She's like, we're doing too many things, and I, that means I can put two other people doing something else instead of splitting uh, garlic into seed garlic. So, nice. Um. Yeah, pre-mixing greens. That's a. There's different ways to do that. I've worked on a farm that did that. Um, this, you know, this difference between bulk harvest and field harvest is not something to ignore in just about every crop. You can, or a lot of different crops. You know, something like blueberries. Of course, they're so delicate. But um, I actually have seen um, flat trays with that are picked right into, and you can wear that. You know, with a with a, a loop around the neck. Uh, I, I know some growers at the Green Mountain Orchards have uh, some of the harvesters experiment with that and they really liked it. So it's like that just you're not pouring the things ever. They're going right in and they're ready. They're ready to get packed for for retail or wholesale. Um, so yeah, any thoughts about field harvest? Anyone doing anything there? Um, it's a obvious, you know, a, a winner when it comes to both uh, a win-win, I should say, quality, food safety risk is lower and um, can be a lot faster or better use of time and resources. We do it with some stuff. I'm just always nervous. Like our harvest van is gross and our dogs in there. I mean, it's not gross, but I'm just so much more comfortable with knowing that my stuff is going into something that hasn't been in the field. Um, that said, we the only thing we do straight into a pint is a sh is strawberries. Mm. That's a really good point, Taylor. Though, like it's if you're field packing, right? That's that is the point that it's at that state. It's going to the customer and whatever you're you're sort of. So you think about that sort of clean um, clean production line. Um, yeah having a dedicated trailer or even something that is being used and cleaned regularly get stuff out of the field i am um, i i field pack cabbages oh um, yeah just because i'm i just am always under the assumption that that outer layer is getting peeled um yeah. so i yeah unless they're like very dirty i i will field pack them nice and do you have um are they going on into box like bulk boxes or how to? How it depends on if it's for if it's for wholesale or not, or mm -hmm. for for the farm stand. Uh, sometimes just into a, a a bulk crate or into a bag in a bulk crate. Cool. Okay. Well, we are just out of time, and I just want to end with this uh, because we were talking about parents and parenting and kids last time. And this is something that a colleague of ours, Becca Maiden Mountain, actually her daughter has been a big help. And she, you know, she, Ruthie 
the girl in this picture is, you know, she's not like every kid, whatever. So that's I just want to put that out there that sometimes not doing childcare can work, but it doesn't always work. And, you know, I'm sure Taylor would have a different feeling of it. More to say, um, and this is a topic for another time. But it's something to think about if you you are a parent um, to think about family work life balance and are there ways you can uh, either minimize or put things together in a way that's helpful. So I'm not opening up that can of worms for conversation. <laughs> all right, excellent. Well. Thank you all that there is a lot of stuff we've covered and there's a lot more I'm sure I'm going to repost the link to this um, to our eval. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, thank you, Taylor. Uh, we'll just stick around here for a few minutes until people have submitted this and it's great to see you all. <laughs>